I invite you this morning to turn with me, to look with me at um, the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with verse 14 through verse 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, our rock, it is a joy to, to gather and worship this morning, to feel the freedom of being in the presence of your spirit. You are always calling us, God, at different points in our lives. May we seek to respond in new ways to how you invite us to live out as your live out your, your sense of discipleship in this community and beyond. Help us to know what it means to follow you in today's world. May you remind us and challenge us and equip us and nourish us in our hour of worship together, that we may take joy, that we may delight in who you are and who we are as your people. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you our Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. I love to throw things away. I love to purge. My favorite day of the week happens to be garbage day. I know that's kind of twisted, but to me it feels like a new beginning. You can purge all the bad stuff, all the, the garbage, the junk, and still have, and you get kind of an instant clean slate. I love to purge. Hillary does not love throwing things away as much as I do. So early in our marriage, we compromised and we established an annual purge day where we go throughout the entire house uh, collecting all the bad or useless things or things we don't need or use anymore and either throwing them away or giving them to goodwill. And it's been a good thing for our marriage because I'm not constantly patrolling the house, looking for things to get rid of, because I know purge day is coming. <laughs> and she, on the other hand, can only let things pile up so much because she knows purge day is coming. <laughs> it feels nice to get rid of the junk and to be left with the good, useful, sentimental, valuable things. It's easy to get rid of the trash. The hardest part, the hardest part, is letting go of the good stuff, isn't it? The gospel message this morning is only seven verses, but those seven verses pack a serious punch. There's a lot being offered here. There's a lot at stake. There is a lot that is left behind. There is a lot that is let go. There is a lot to be gained. Mark begins his gospel like an alarm clock, persistently declaring the time and demanding a response. For some, the response is to just to hit the snooze button or maybe to throw the alarm clock clear across the room. For others, like these two sets of brothers, the response is immediate, swift, and life-altering. They leave everything. They drop everything and follow Jesus. Such immediacy in one's response is pretty foreign to us. Foreign to us. We don't just up and leave everything especially when our, our well-being is at stake. We usually have to discern, we reflect on things, we pray, 
We consider all our options. We create a list of pros and cons, maybe form a task force or a committee. We weigh the implications of our decision, especially if they involve family. Were Peter, Andrew, James, and John that desperate for something new? Or were they so compelled and taken by this man, Jesus, walking alongside the shore and what he had to say to them? They don't even give a response. We are told they just drop their nets and go. That is their response. In Judaism in that day, these fishermen would have most likely known what Jesus meant when he said, follow me. Because followers were sort of a subclass of people in that day. Followers were people who had a deep longing for God. And in order to get that longing satisfied, they would gravitate toward the local rabbi, thinking he was their best chance for them to get closer to God. And followers would sit at the rabbi's feet, listen to him, listen to him teach and, and hang on his every word. They would watch him and observe him and everything he, he did, considering it a privilege and an honor to see what he does, how he acts, how he responds. And if there were several rabbis in town, you would know which followers belonged to which rabbi because they would model their lives after him. They would even look like him, talk like him, think like him. A follower or a disciple, in this sense, doesn't just want to know what the rabbi knows. A disciple wants to be like the rabbi and wants to learn to do what the rabbi does. But there's another cultural aspect to all this that I think sheds light on the weight of being a follower back then and the weight of the story, which I also think totally changes the game for us today. You see, in those days, all the kids went to basically what is rabbi school to study the Torah. And around age 12 or 13, a cut was made. The brilliant students in rabbi school got the privilege of asking the rabbi if they could become his lifelong followers. The rabbi would never initially ask the student because that would be beneath him. Rather, the brilliant, the best of the best students got to ask the rabbi. But if the rabbi saw that the kid indeed showed exemplary skill and knowledge, if he had what it took, the rabbi would say, come, follow me. Which meant that there were a bunch of kids who didn't make the cut. They were the losers. And they went back into the trades like being a fisherman. So what we have here in the story are some loser fishermen who didn't make the cut. And this Jesus, a newly rising rabbi on the block, comes along, walking down the beach, encountering them on their own turf, and actually asks them if they would follow him. If they're fishermen, and Jesus calls them to be his disciples, then they're not following another rabbi. And if they're not following another rabbi, they're not the best of the best. They didn't make the cut. Were you ever relegated to the JV team or the B team or even the C or D team when you were younger? That was basketball in middle school for me. It was more insulting than any kind of affirmation because it couldn't be more obvious that I wasn't the best or even in the company of the best. I wasn't good enough. Maybe you didn't even make it through tryouts. Or maybe you've been turned away from a school, turned away by a professor, a teacher, or even your field of study because you were told someone made the decision for you that you weren't good enough, that what you had wasn't enough. Or maybe you have been turned down from a job told that you didn't meet the qualifications, which essentially means that you're not good enough. It's painful being told that we can't do something, or even when we're not even allowed to try to do it. And Jesus' invitation to these fishermen wasn't just to go do something, although doing has always been a large part of it. <clears throat> he put an identity claim on these fishermen. Following Jesus meant that the best within each of them was yet to be. 
And Jesus does the same with us, essentially. He may not be walking down the beach, meeting us on the shore. He may not show up in our backyards or walk into our homes or into our garages or our places of work. But then again, maybe he does meet us in those places. It is my hunch, actually it's more than a hunch, it's a deep-seated belief that God is always seeking us out. When we wake up each day, when we make coffee and get dressed, when we step out of the door of our homes and go wherever we are summoned to go, Jesus is again giving that invitation right there in front of us. Follow me. Not knowing where it will lead, only knowing who is leading us. And most of us are not the best of the best. Some of us may be, may be told that we're not even close enough to being good enough. But guess what? God has made it abundantly clear throughout the entire biblical narrative, the entire story of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, that nobody is good enough. But God is. And that is enough. You can say what you want about the Bible, but nobody can say that God doesn't repeatedly, repeatedly invite misfits and losers and screw-ups and self-absorbed, ridiculously broken people to share in God's design and redesign of God's world. Over and over and over again, God calls them in some form or fashion and says, follow me, trust me. Look to me. Pay attention to me. God tells us we are good enough and invites us to find our way in his way. This is discipleship. It takes both a moment and a lifetime to unfold. In our culture, though, it's really good to be a leader and less good to be a follower. There's no power in following. There are no perks no recognition, no glory. The world, the word follow carries with it risk and sacrifice and that you don't have it all together. And when we choose to follow, though, we choose to place our trust in God's direction for our lives, for our living, which can come about sometimes in a moment. It also means finding one sense of family in a community like this, bound by commitment to Jesus. And that can often take a lifetime. To really value. And we begin to see on the shore of Galilee what that looks like. And that it also may mean leaving something good behind. Letting go of something good. For certain we leave behind the garbage in our lives. The stuff that needs to be dumped or sent elsewhere. Our sins, our, our bad habits, our poor attitudes, our limited perspectives, our closed minds. But a good fishing boat and strong nets are not garbage. What these fishermen had going for themselves was pretty good. It was good enough. They were actually established members of society. And what about the father, Zebedee? Have you ever noticed him in this story? He was just left in the boat. Oh, to know what he was thinking and feeling at this moment. What just happened? What kind of nonsense have my sons gotten into now? I've been their only means of support, and they just up and leave without even saying thank you? They left, though. And they left with the courage to leave the good behind while in search of the best. They may not have fully known where that would take them or what they got themselves into, but they trusted that it was far better than their good enough situation. And Mark, the writer Mark, could have easily just said of the disciples' response that they immediately followed Jesus. But the word nets shows up. He said they immediately left their nets, and boats for that matter. And if they're still hanging on to their nets, they're not going to go anywhere. Those nets, they can represent a lot of what is easiest to hang on to, what is most comfortable and safe, what is, what is certain and known. I have my nets. We all have our nets. And the reality is, nets aren't necessarily bad. 
but that may not be the best either. Max Lucado tells the story of a little boy who fell out of bed. And when his mom asked him what happened, he answered, I don't know. I guess I stayed too close to where I got in. <laughs> it's tempting and safe and comfortable to just stay where we are and to not move forward. God knows that. And so God took the initiative and moved toward us. May that be enough for us to drop our nets and follow. We don't have to worry about making the cut because we're not the best. Jesus invites us. And for anyone who accepts his invitation, who drops their nets and follows, well, we're still discovering all there is to gain from that, aren't we? The story is far from over. The best God has to offer is always better than our good enough. So may we enjoy following the leader. Amen.